It is indeed a pleasure and a privilege for me to at least have been invited by Moray House Trust to speak on the matter of sugar, an issue that is of seminal importance in the economic life of Guyana. As I understand it, the mission of your trust is, among other things, to stimulate the sharing of knowledge and ideas and to promote public conversation about them. It is my hope that my contribution here this evening will be sufficiently constructive to permit your organization to fulfill that mission. As you know, from the start of this country as a colony to today, our lives in one form or another have been intertwined with sugar, given the dominant role it played in output, in employment, exports, government revenues, and foreign reserves. For example, in 1991, sugar was responsible for about 15% of the goods and services that were produced in Guyana. At that time, too, sugar provided about 26% of the income which the economic participants in the economy earned in that year. Sugar's contribution to output was down to 4% in 2014, and its contribution to income was a mere 7%. The halcyon days of sugar seem to be behind us, and the future of the industry hangs in the balance. Its fate is in the hands of a commission of inquiry before which I had the privilege of presenting my views on what course of action serves the best interests of taxpayers of this country. I have no doubt that the commission of inquiry will act in the best interests of the industry and the nation as a whole. Conscious of this reality, my task this evening is to place before you information about the sugar industry, which hopefully would help us all to leave here no lesser friends than we were when we walked into this room earlier, but sufficiently convinced that a radical change was needed in the industry. With that feeling of assurance, I will present an overview of the sugar industry under the title of Sugar and Guyana, an exasperating relationship. While the focus of my presentation will be on modern day industry in Guyana, it will periodically dally into the past in order to provide sufficient context for the points that I wish to make. Because data on the totality of the history of sugar was not readily available to me, the dalliance into history will have to differ, will have to depend on differing time periods and sources. I chose the title of Sugar and Guyana, an exasperating relationship for my presentation because it aptly captures the evolution of sugar production in Guyana and the way things are in the industry today. Sugar might be a monopoly at home, but because the bulk of the sugar is sold in foreign markets, the industry and its survivability must be assessed against factors prevailing in the export environment. In the global context, Guyana with a market share of 0.1% of sugar exports is a marginal player and faces conditions akin to that of a perfectly competitive market. Once the EU protected prices and US entry preferences are removed, profit maximization requires that the price Guyana receives for sugar to be equal to its marginal cost of sugar production. Even if profit maximization is not the motive 
the bottom line would have to be at least to break even for it to make sense to remain in the industry without having to rely perennially on taxpayer contributions. For that to happen, the world price must be equal to the average cost of production. The current average cost of production of a pound of sugar in Guyana is roughly 40 cents, while the world price this morning, yes, US cents, while the world price this morning was US 11.67 cents. As a price taker, the onus is on Guyana to reduce its cost of production drastically to the level of world prices. My thesis is that that will be very difficult to achieve unless the industry could come up with exceptionally innovative ways to do business. Otherwise, it makes no sense staying in the industry given the physical, human, and financial constraints facing it. We might be attached to the sugar industry for sentimental reasons, but nostalgia, I'm afraid, is not a good substitute for efficiency and rationality. So in presenting the overview, I will identify issues which must be addressed to get Guyana to the point of efficiency. One is the condition for sustaining ownership. A second is the challenge to overcome uncontrollable risk factors. And the third is overcoming the imposing financial burden that faces the industry at the moment. As we reflect on where the industry started to where it is today, our mind should go to the acreage on the cultivation. An average of 46,556 hectares of land has been under sugar cultivation annually from 1961 to 2010. It should be noted that the area under cult cultivation fluctuated wildly during the period in reference. The largest acreage on the sugar was achieved in 1981 when over 67,000 hectares of land was under cultivation. The smallest acreage on the cultivation occurred in 1989 when, according to the FAO stat report, 37,000 hectares of land was placed into cultivation. It might surprise many to know that Guyana has not been able to maintain that average annual acreage since 1991. There were variations in the output and yield as well. If we were to look at the 50-year period from 1961 to 2010, we would see that output varied wildly too. The highest output of 375,000 tons of cane was achieved way back in 1971, while the lowest output was recorded in 1990. The best yield of 90.47 tons of cane per hectare from cultivation was achieved again many years ago in 1962, while the lowest of 56.34 tons of cane per hectare occurred in 2008. The average for the period was 73.6 tons of cane per hectare. For the last 20 years, Guyana was unable to maintain that annual average, even though it exceeded it on four occasions during that period. The best and worst conversion rates to sugar occurred in different time periods as well. The best conversion rate of 9.9 .9 tons of cane per, per ton of sugar occurred in 2000 while the worst conversion rate of 18.12 took place in 1991. One positive note in all of this is that there were improvements in the cane to sugar conversion rates from 2001 to 2010. As we could see from the data, size of acreage does not necessarily match size of output or yield. Some of the writers on, on sugar in Guyana, including Professor Thomas and R.J. Orty, have pointed to the positive relationship between favorable export prices and the investment in the industry. It has been observed that when the guaranteed prices of the Commonwealth Sugar Agreement kicked in, 
in the, in the mid-1950s, the industry was able to modernize its operations and improve its efficiency. As such, by the early 1960s, the industry was experiencing its highest cane cultivation and cane sugar conversion ratios. The best performance by the industry followed those years of investment. Prior to the adoption of the Commonwealth Sugar Agreement, according to Orti, every sugar producer was struggling. Guyanese were given the assurance that the investment in the skeleton operations a few years ago would help to improve things in the industry. The only problem was that that investment had an inverse relationship to the price of sugar that Guyana was receiving. The European Union was reducing its price support, and the United States of America made no promises. Further, the CARICOM market, which was once ours the corner, now has to be shared with Belize and Jamaica. The adverse effects of these issues of low price and high cost converge in the financial statements of the company, Gaisuko, that manages the industry. The numbers that show up in the more recent reports of Gaisuko influence my attitude towards the company, since they provide evidence of the need to radically alter the nature of the sugar industry. My disposition to Gaisuko's present predicament is influenced by the following three standpoints. One, Gaisuko is a publicly owned company that was not set up with a defined lifespan. It was expected to survive as long as its business activities and performance would permit it to do so. Two, Gaisuko was set up at a time when the government wanted to control the commanding heights of the economy. I have not come across any evidence, however, that the government then or later gave assurance that taxpayers' money would always be available to bail out the company if it were to find itself in trouble. Third, since the introduction of the Economic Recovery Program in, 1998, in 1988, pardon, Gaisuko, like other public enterprises, was expected to perform at an efficiency level that did not impose a burden on taxpayers, since the Hoyt government had agreed with the international financial institutions to drastically reduce the internal payment imbalances. Privatization of Gaisuko was considered a viable option at that time. And even though it did not happen, Gaisuko was expected to rely on sources other than the government for both short-term and long-term financing, if that need arose. Any company that wants to survive has to be able to finance its operations from the money that customers give it. This philosophical position is based on the simple premise that a company must have some kind of economic and social value to its owner, customers, and additionally to society at large. The economic and social value of a company is usually identified by a combination of several factors, some of which include profits, employment, and taxes paid into the economy. I would simply like to indicate that there are times when it is necessary to make some very difficult and hard decisions. And it is my view that to the extent that we are unable to find alternative financing for Gaisuko, maybe a partner in the industry, it is my view that Gaisuko or, or, or the government of Guyana should exit the industry. It is with a heavy heart that I offer that view because I understand the implications that it has for those who depend on the industry. But when you recognize that Gaisuko took out of the Guyana economy in two years alone twice as much as it put in in four years, one must realize 
that the game might be close to an end. In my view, Gaisuko has taken as much as 25 billion from the economy, and this cannot and should not be allowed to continue. Despite the lack of utility, there seems to be an attitude among some, especially those who controlled Gaisuko, that it was okay to waste taxpayers' money while keeping Gaisuko alive. The data that I presented tells me that we need to recognize that that cannot continue forever. I simply wish to conclude by saying that an important historical fact is that the investment in sugar in Guyana started with private money in the 1640s. As we speak, the government of Guyana, on behalf of the taxpayers of this nation, is the owner of the investment. The decisions about the industry must keep in mind the perspective and impact that continued government ownership means for economic growth and the well-being of all Guyanese. For all the pleasures that sugar has brought us in the chocolates and candies and cakes, I do not think that continuing an inefficient operation could compensate for that. I wish to thank you very much.